uh, greet you. Jesus Christ, the one who said, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. And this morning I want to talk about joy. Uh, we take, I take my mom to church once a month, and at the home she lives in, there's this quote on the, on the wall. Um, let me see if I can... When joy is a habit. Love is the reflex. I don't know. Do you ever come across that quote? When joy is a habit, love is the reflex. Where do you find it at in the Bible? <laughs> I don't have a Bible verse for that one. But every time I would take mom to church, but I'd see that on the wall, and I'm going, is that true? Is it true or isn't it true? And that's one of the things that... You know, other men's writings, you have to kind of sort through it and say, is it true or isn't it true? When joy is a habit, love is a reflex. You know what a reflex is? You go for that physical exam at the doctor, and uh, they, they take that little hammer, and they go, bang, and your leg goes, and you have no control over that. They know you're still alive because your leg did that, okay? That's called reflex. And what they're saying is that, He's saying that love is something that's just going to happen and you don't have any control over it if joy is a habit of life. What's a habit? Anybody have any habits here? Oh, we all have good habits and we have bad habits, don't we? I have a sister-in-law that has, I don't know if it's a good habit or bad habit, it's an irritating habit, all right? It's this, and she's doing this all the time and it's like, lady, when are you going to get a grip on that? I, I pity her husband, but, you know, don't try to change it. She's been doing that for years, and she's still doing that, okay? Good habit, bad habit, just irritating habit. So we all have habits in life, something that somehow it kind of developed, and we, we just do it, and maybe don't even realize that we're doing that, all right? Think about that. Joy being a habit, something that we aren't even aware that's happening in our life. <clears throat> now, yesterday it was, let, let me, let me, def there's a difference between joy and happiness this morning. Now, you don't have to agree with me, but I believe there's a difference. There are people in this world, unbelieving people in this world who are happy people. The chemical makeup of their brain, they have happy moments and they have unhappy moments. But joy is something <clears throat> that we receive only from Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, and the list goes on. So an unbeliever cannot have joy. Only the believer can have joy. But an unbeliever can be happy. I've met a lot of unbelieving people who are happy people. I mean, they're just happy. <laughs> that does not mean that... Uh, they have joy, all right? So let's remember that. Joy is only for the believer. It's something that we receive from Jesus Christ. And that's what he said. He says, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. We had that in our, in our Sunday school passage, the joy of Christ in our life. I like to illustrate it this way. Yesterday, we had bright sunshine, didn't we? Anybody see the sun this morning when you got up? It wasn't there, but was the sun shining? Well, we, we know that somewhere it was shining. It looks like it might be shining out there right now. Our joy is a little like that. Our joy is, is always there, but there are times in life when the clouds block it out doesn't mean we lost our joy, but it's been blocked out, all right? So let's remember that. Sometimes we don't feel happy. Sometimes we don't feel joyful. It doesn't mean we have lost our joy. 
because the joy of the Lord is something that is always there, just like the sunshine in the sky. I'd like to, I'd like to sing Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, number 83 in your, your songbook. <clears throat> Join me in singing that. I To this morning to be a possessor of immortal gladness. Today, it's not something that we have to wait for in eternity. We can be a possessor of that today. My question to you is, are you a possessor of that? So this morning, I cannot go out and get joy. I can't buy it. I can't go get it. It is something that is given to me by God. The only way I can receive that is by opening my life up and letting Jesus Christ come into my life and possess my life and fill my life. <clears throat> I'm just going to bunny trail here a little bit. <clears throat> we were talking about in our Sunday school class. One, one of the things that I'm going to say frustrates me in Anabaptist teaching is, so we have the cross <clears throat> And we all come to the cross, we understand, we come to the cross, that Christ gave his life on the cross for, our, for us. And then we're baptized, okay? And then what we do next? So we have the account in scripture of the man who, uh, he was possessed of a, a devil, right? And what happened to the man who was possessed of the, the devil? His house was cleaned and garnished, okay? So when we come to the cross, we accept Jesus Christ in our life, and our house is cleaned and garnished. And then what does he say happens after that? Somebody. He's going to get filled with something. He's going to be filled with something. And if you don't fill it with something, what happens? He comes back, and not just by himself, he brings seven demons worse than what was there before. So what are we supposed to fill this house with? The glory of God. The glory of God. All right, that's right. The righteousness of Christ. So the Jews didn't get that in, in the passage you read. They said, well, I'm not going to accept Christ's righteousness in my house, I am going to create my own righteousness. 
And I'm afraid that too many Anabaptist people are doing the very same thing. They're creating their own righteousness and they're trying to live out of this house their righteousness. We are to have Christ's righteousness in us and then out of that righteousness we produce good works. We don't fill the house up with good works. The good works is a result of the righteousness of Christ in our life. Anyway, money trail. This morning, the joy of the Lord. If joy is going to be a habit, we have the responsibility this morning to maintain the habit. And that's what I'd like to look at this morning. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 1. I'm going to give you five things this morning that I believe are important for us to be able to maintain the joy of the Lord in our life. And some of this is going to be a little bit redundant because uh, we already had some of this this morning. But I think that's, that's, that's great whenever we have a, a continuity. Sorry about that. Turn the mic on here. Where our, our thoughts are coming together. So Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. If you want to maintain joy in your life, it has to do with what you're going to think about. What are you meditating on? If you're reading the news and your mind is full of the news, what's going to happen to your joy, folks? Up, down, out the door, right? Now, I, I can get very... I can get very into the news, all right? That's very easy for me to do. But somewhere I realized that, you know, when I start to get very absorbed into what's happening in our world and all the politics and things, my joy has a way of going away. Because all of a sudden I have to sort through a lot of things. Truth and error. What are you meditating on? He says that if we meditate on the law of God, that's because it's truth. News, you don't know if they're telling you the truth or not. It all has to do with who's, who's telling you the news. If you listen to Fox News, it's one way. If you listen to the other news stations, it's going to probably be something else. And it's all spun to whoever they favor. But... When we meditate in the law of God, there is, it's truth all the way through. We don't have to sort through what is truth and what is error. That's what frustrated me about this thing. I read it and I'm going, is that true? And I had to filter it out. I had to think it through. I had to sort it out. But when I read the word of God, I don't have to spend time trying to figure out, is it true or not? Because by faith, I know that it is truth. All right? So what are you meditating on? If you find that you're losing your joy in life, it might just be because you're not thinking about the right thing. All right? We had the, the thought of being offended. If somebody offends you and you spent all day thinking about how, how bad they offended you, what happened to your joy? I know what happens to my joy. It's gone. I cannot maintain the joy of the Lord in my life if I don't bring every thought into captivity by the power of Jesus Christ. All right? Now, that's Bible. We have the responsibility to bring every thought into captivity by the power of Jesus Christ. I remember years ago, I was standing a place one night, and I they had a devotional book there in the, the nightstand. And I, I picked it up, and I read it, and it's this little account that the young man came to his pastor, and he said, he said, if I could somehow get a grip on my thoughts, my life would be so much easier. And the pastor said to him, he said, I want you to remember one thing. You can only think one thought at one time. 
And I read that and I went, come on, I'm sharper than all that. <laughs> and then I tried it. Try it. Can't do that. And that's why the Bible says bringing every thought into captivity by the power of Jesus Christ. Now, I can be driving down the road. I can be doing something and thinking something else. But I can only process one thought at one time. And so God has given us the responsibility to bring every thought into captivity. Now, there's, I don't know how many thousand thoughts we might think in a day. And I think Satan just bombards our minds with all these thoughts that somehow intimidate us to think that it's not possible to bring every thought into captivity. God holds you only responsible for the ones that you process. It's not the multitude that come into your mind. It's the one that you, you stop and you start to spin around in your mind. That's the one that God says you're responsible for what you think. And you better bring it into captivity, all right? If we don't, we will lose the joy of the Lord in our life. A man, well, it was my wife's great uncle. He thought he was going to die. And he's laying in bed all depressed. He's going to die. And his wife was trying to get the chickens ready to butcher and take to market. And she finally came in. She said, well, if you're going to die, you might as well die dressing chickens. Get out here and help me dress chickens. And, and the man said, well, I, I got up and I got out there. And he never died until he was 90-something years old. So what was wrong? Well, he was thinking about the fact that I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And he was depressing himself the more he thought about it. He was not bringing his thoughts into captivity. All right? That's why work's a good thing. You know, if you're depressed, go out and get to work. It's going to make a big difference in your life. God gave us work to give us something to focus our minds on. So if you want to maintain joy in your life, start to bring into captivity every thought, and it will make a difference in your life. Number two, in verse one, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. This is the man who is blessed. This is the man who has joy in his life. Stop and think about what is the conversations that you are having with other people. You know, it doesn't take a smart person to be critical. Smart people are the ones who have a solution to the problem. Anybody can see the flaws but what's the solution to it, all right? So if we want to be individuals who are maintaining the joy of the Lord in our life, we are looking for solutions rather than looking for the flaws. The scornful person is the person that simply sees flaws, and they never stop to process how did the flaw happen and how do we resolve it. And if we start to associate only with the people who have flaws and can see flaws, we will lose our joy. The power of joy is the fact that there is hope projected beyond the flaws of life. And that hope is in Jesus Christ. And what solution did he give us to the flaw and to the problem that we see in life? And that's ideology. I realize that. And sometimes it's like, this looks impossible. But it does not have to be impossible. It doesn't have to be impossible. It's not in the seat of the scornful. God deliver us if we are the scornful. And God have mercy on us if, if we enjoy the company of the scornful. Let's be the individuals who, who are looking for the solutions to problems. What's, what's the solution to the problem? How do I get there? How do I implement it? It's going to change whether you're a joyful person or whether you're not a joyful person. You know, some people, when they call you, you already know where that conversation's going to go. You already know, wow, this is going to be the next 
depressing moment of my life. The other day, somebody called me for an hour. And I'm sitting in heavy traffic, and, and I, I was, my joy was going down the, down the t- tube really fast. And I was thinking, and we had these long pauses. He would say something, and it was like, did he hang up? Did he, did he hang up? I hope so. <laughs> oh, no, he was still there. You still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Ah. We meet people like that. And and somewhere we want to be gracious. But the problem was I couldn't solve his problem. Forty-some years old and wanted to get married, and his dad didn't think he should get married. Now what do you do? What kind of advice should you give somebody like that? And then on top of that, I had a a 34-year-old call me who was trying to date a girl that her Dad didn't want her to get married, and she was 30-some years old. And I'm going, what's wrong with these dads? What do they don't understand about life? If there's going to be more of us somewhere, they've got to get married. Come on. <laughs> Man, send them back to biology class or something. What? <laughs> so I, I was having a really bad day. <laughs> the seed of the scornful. Somewhere, yeah, I, was, I had to bring my own thoughts into captivity, all right? So, let's, let's be careful that we are not the ones who are the perpetuators of, of scorn and depression in other people's lives. But let's have the joy of the Lord in our life where we can be an inspiration to, to other people. Let's go to Luke chapter 17. There's something here that I think is very important in, in maintaining joy in our life. <clears throat> And I want to start reading here. I'll start reading in verse 11. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem, Luke 17. <clears throat> that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten, lepers, ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourself unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, where are not, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save the stranger. And he said unto them, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Gratitude. A thankful person will always have joy in their life. Ten men who were cleansed, but only one of them had an instant response of gratitude. The others said, well, we better obey. I have a problem with the, the obsession that people have with obedience. This, this man did not obey what Christ told him to do, right? He said, go show yourself to the priest. And when he saw he was cleansed, he didn't go show himself to the priest. He actually came back to the high priest, right? Jesus Christ, the great high priest. He came back, and his first response was gratitude. Thank you, Lord. The others were obsessed with obedience, and we better go show ourselves to the priest before we lose our cleansing and our healing. They missed the point. The point was they were healed. Who healed them? Who gave them the way, the truth, and the life? You in your life? Be thankful, people. Don't be, you know, you know how our little children, we say, I'll say thank you. Maybe my children are exceptions. And they would take that stubborn, mm, and I go, say it. All right, then you don't get it. You know, some of them would say it right away, the next one, no, they just get that stubborn on, they weren't going to, they weren't going to cooperate. We tried to teach them gratitude. That's not That doesn't bring joy. A forced thankfulness does not bring joy. The joy that God wants in your heart is the joy that comes out of that spontaneous, 
I'm going to turn around and I'm going to run back and I'm going to fall down and say, thank you, Lord. Gratitude. Are you thankful for all the things that God has given to you? You know what takes away our gratitude in life? When we start looking at what else has and we wish we had that. Gratitude. Are you thankful for what you have? <clears throat> you know, there are, there are people who, who are just spontaneously thankful. My dad was in the, in the hospital, and he was a dying man there in the hospital. And the nurses would come in and do something, and, and he would say, thank you. And the next nurse would come in and just thank you. And I'm there thinking, that's all, he's, that's all he's saying anymore is just thank you, thank you to all these nurses. And I'm thinking, I bet they think that's a little strange. He was simply living out of a heart of gratitude. He knew he was going to die. He told us that night, he said, I, I'd go out to the car to get, get something. i come back in and said, Dad wants to talk to you. So I went back and Dad gave me a hug. He said, I don't know if I'm going to live any longer tonight. But I just want to know that everything's right. He said, if I've done anything between you and me, just forgive me. And I want to bless you in your ministry. Dad, Dad was not a huggy person. That meant a lot to me. But Dad was a grateful person. Dad had a big heart. Dad had the joy of the Lord on his deathbed. He worried that he would lose his mind before he went. He took care of his dad, and his dad had lost his mind for a number of years. He had to care for him. And he said, I just hope he can have a sound mind. And God gave him that. God gave him that. One morning, my brother checked on him, and he was gone. He had the joy of the Lord in his heart because he was a grateful person. The things that he had in life, he had because God gave them to him, and that's the way he, he handled his possessions in life. Let's remember that. The fourth thing. Timothy says, godliness with contentment is great. Gain. It's contentment. Somebody tell me. Definition of contentment. Let me give you a simple one. Wanting what I have. Okay? Wanting what I have. You know, children, if you have a tricycle and you're content, you want a tricycle rather than the bicycle. And then we realize that after a while your legs get a little long for the tricycle. That's true enough. But contentment is simply saying, well, I, I want this old bicycle. It still works. That's fine. And I'm content. You, you remember as a child when you wanted that bicycle and you thought that you would get a 10-speed. I thought if I had a 10-speed bicycle, I would never ask my parents for another thing in my life. I'd be the happiest person on planet Earth. What do you think happened? Saw a picture of a 15-speed. <laughs> You know, after somewhere in our natural way of processing life, we just, there's something else out there. There's just something else out there. And we're adult people acting the same way. Discontent will take the joy out of your life. Discontent takes the joy out of life. So at what point do we say we've had enough? Telling Steve, brother in our congregation, he he was a businessman, and it it flowed. It just it just worked. 
but he sold his business and started another one, and he was trying to decide, you know, either a business grows, all right? So what do you do when it's growing? He said, we kind of just like to keep it maybe a family affair. And he, he was, I said, well, brother, I mean, God gave you the gift of accumulation, running a business, whatever. So make use of it. Bless people by giving them jobs. Um, was he discontent? Well, if it started to affect his joy, well, then maybe you need to make some adjustments to that. But sometimes God gives people gifts, and it's not because they're discontent. It's because God gave opportunity. Take the opportunity. Now, sometimes in our ambition of life, we chase opportunities, and the real opportunities we miss. This man that I'm referring to wasn't chasing opportunity. The opportunities were coming to him. I want you to remember that. Contentment in life is understanding that when we are content in life, it's usually when God starts to bring more opportunities into our life. But when I'm discontent, I'm chasing opportunity, and all of a sudden, I lose my joy, and that's where the passage says, they that want to be rich in this world bring problems into their family. They bring problems into the family because they're chasing opportunity rather than letting the opportunities come to them because of contentment in their life. Let's not forget that. I remember one successful businessman saying, Somebody came to him and said, what, at what point do I expand my business? He said, well, if you're looking at business expansion, remember this. If you don't have 50% of the money for the expansion you're anticipating, don't do it. That simply means that the business couldn't produce 50% of the expansion. It probably doesn't, isn't going to produce enough to pay the whole bill. But if it produced 50%, then there's a probability that it has the potential to produce the other 50% to expand your business. The problem is most business people want to expand before the business did the 50%, and they get into trouble, all right? Contentment brings joy, and it brings peace and rest in our families. Remember that. Peace and rest in our families. First Timothy. Godliness with contentment is great gain. There are people who are just laid back and chilled out, and <laughs> you'd like to put a light a fire on them to get them to, to be active. That's not contentment. That might actually be laziness. But godliness with contentment simply means that we understand. I am content because I know that what I have, I got from God, and God is good. And, and let's never, never forget that. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5, and I'm going to take this passage a little bit out of its context. The context is in relation to church leadership, feeding the flock of God, but verse 7 is the one that I want to emphasize that if we are going to maintain the joy of the Lord in our heart, we need to be willing to do this. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You ever take something to God and say, Lord, I just don't know what to do with this anymore. Here it is. But in your back of your head, you already knew what you wanted God to do. Now, did you cast your care on him? No, you didn't. Casting your care upon the Lord simply means, you know, there it is, and whatever God decides to do with that, I'm okay with. That is truly casting your care upon the Lord. But when you cast it on the Lord and say, here it is, Lord, I expect you to do thus and thus to prove to me that you are God, you missed the point completely. You will not have joy because God isn't going... God is not your servant. You are God's servant. 
And so if God doesn't perform according to the way you expect, you're going to lose your joy. You're going to be unhappy with God. But when you can learn to take that and say, here it is, Lord, let go of it and walk away. And what, however you work it out, I'm okay with that. You're going to experience the joy of the Lord like you never did before. Why? Because you're resigned to whatever the results are going to be. You're totally resigned to that. That takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of faith. You know, we tend to worry, we tend to stress, we tend to stew over things. What if? That big question of what if. Recently, my wife ended up in the ER, and at the ER, they took a CAT scan and realized that she had a mass on one of her kidneys, and uh, what if it's cancerous? What if? That's, that's a scary thought. What if? Okay. Somewhere you, you, you have to say, I can't change that. I can't change that. But we will work toward finding a solution to the problem, if possible. And if not possible, then we have to simply resign ourselves to God. The solution was remove the kidney. They tested it, and yes, it, it was cancerous, but it wasn't anything serious. But we had several weeks of what if life changing things that come into our lives that we can't change. Do we need to lose the joy of the Lord? No. Because when we can cast all our care upon Him, and say, Lord, I, I don't know what's going on inside of me. <laughs> you know, and you can heal, and I'm resigned to whatever comes out of that. We can understand the joy of the Lord, even though our minds keep wanting to say, what if, what if, what if, okay? Because now we're resting in the hands of the creator and the healer. And with him, all things are possible. Let us stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful this morning that you were willing to give us your joy. Father, may we maintain that joy in our life with a relationship with you. And may we allow that joy to be radiant in our lives. And Father, we, we know that the clouds come and the dark times come, but may we have that faith and exercise in our life to live according to your will and your purpose for your honor and glory. We ask your blessing upon all present here today that they might know the joy of the Lord in, your, in their heart, in their life, and that that might be an inspiration to them as they go throughout life. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and I guess... Uh,